Peace be with you, brothers and sisters. So first, uh, let me read the passage. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let us pray again. Father, please, please speak to our hearts and our minds and our view, and so that we can know your will your way, and we can be like your Son, Jesus Christ. In his precious name we pray, amen. Brothers and sisters, today we are going to reflect on the second and third sentence, sentences of the Apostles' Creed concerning Jesus Christ. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. These two sentences concisely summarize the entire earthly life of Jesus Christ. The first one, conceived by the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary, leads us into the mystery of incarnation, where the Son of God, being true God himself, became the real man, Jesus. Jesus' birth was a miracle marked by conception by the Holy Spirit and birth from a virgin. For those who value reason and science, accepting this miracle might be quite hard because it does not align with the scientific theories of conception and birth. Actually, it is not necessary to use biological or medical evidence to prove the possibility of virgin birth. Every significant event in the gospel is beyond scientific laws and principles, beyond human, and human understanding. And this miracle is one such example, revealing the power of God. The Apostles' Creed does not explain how this conception by the Holy Spirit occurred, nor does the Bible give us any clue. The focus of this miracle is that this Jesus truly was born, and the true God truly became a human. Jesus Christ, like all humans, including you and me, was conceived in his mother's womb and this happened at a certain historical point. Then he was born, grew up, lived, and finally died. The Gospel of Luke tells us about the historical background of his birth. And as I highlight on the screen, 
those two political figures, Caesar Augustus, and the second one, Quirinius, the governor of Syria, both of them are historical political figures. And important things about them were written in history books, including this one mentioned in the Gospel of Luke. And this action of God was initiated and carried out by God himself alone. In the midst of the world's darkness and corruption, in the midst of man's helpless, helplessness and hopelessness, God actively entered human history, truly becoming a part of the creature. He actively entered the old creation, created a new beginning, the new hope for men. Every year, the church celebrates Christmas, which commemorates the miracle of the birth of Jesus Christ, the miracle of God becoming man, which was realized through two agents, the Holy Spirit and Mary. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit transformed lives and brought new life in the midst of death. Now, as God creates a new beginning in the creature, the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon a virgin who is otherwise unable to conceive. Only the Holy Spirit can bring forth this new possibility. The conception by the Holy Spirit points to the divine nature of Jesus Christ who is true man and true God himself. Joseph had nothing to do with Jesus' birth. The main character in the story of Jesus Christ is God himself, who entered the created world to save mankind. Then, what role does Mary play? Mary in the Bible is an ordinary girl an ordinary Jewish girl. The incarnation is entirely the work of God, not the result of any human effort. The Bible highlights Mary's faith and obedience. That's all. When encountering with God, she says, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Born of the Virgin Mary tells us that while Jesus comes from God, he also comes from human being. God gives himself an earthly human origin. Jesus Christ is truly God, but he is also, also fully human, just like us. Divinity and humanity are perfectly united in Jesus Christ. Jesus is a real man, yet he is also God himself. No one has seen God, but in Jesus, God becomes visible. In other words, everything Jesus said and did, from the manger to the cross, clearly reveals God. The message of the kingdom, the call to repentance and discipleship, is delivered by Jesus, who is also God. The one who eats and drinks with sinners is Jesus, who is also God. The one who heals the sick with compassion and forgives sins with mercy is Jesus, who is also God. And at the end, the one who suffers on the cross it's Jesus, who is also God. And now, let us move to the next sentence in the Creed. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The Apostles' Creed 
mentions only two other names, Mary and Pontius Pilate. Pilate was the governor of Judea, the highest Roman official in that region at the time. The people of that era used political figures to indicate the timing of events. Jesus' suffering and Pilate further affirms that Jesus' condemnation and crucifixion are real historical events. Not only did God truly become a man, but he was also executed by a historical Roman official. Pontius Pilate has been condemned by generations of people who recite the Apostles' Creed. Because although he confirmed Jesus' innocence, he did not deliver a just verdict according to the law and his entrusted authority. Instead, he yielded to the popular cry and gave Jesus up under political consideration. His decision was a public rejection of Jesus. Or we can say, a public rejection of God. Unlike Mary, who says yes to God, Pilate replied God with a loud and firm no. As a Roman official, this no means rejection of Roman Empire to God and rejection of earthly political power to God. Furthermore, Pilate, as one person among all mankind, his no means rejection of men including you and me, to God. This no symbolizes humanity's rebellion against God. It is sin. Sin is man's rejection of God's grace, keeping a distance from God, and seeking to do whatever we want to do in the absence of God's presence. When man firmly says no to God, Sin is exposed. <coughs> Crucifixion was the most brutal punishment of the Roman Empire, reserved for traitors and the most wicked criminals who were publicly shamed and died in great agony. For the Israelites, there's another layer of meaning. Being crucified was considered accursed and being cast out of God's covenant. Now, Jesus was crucified and his earthly life ended completely. He then was buried, totally left the world of the living, even descending to hell. And in the Old Testament, hell was also called Hades. It's the place of torment, the place of completely separateness, where man continues to exist only as a non-being, as a shadow. The bad thing about being in hell is that the dead cannot worship God, cannot praise God. Actually, the dead can have nothing to do with God. It, it, it is a state of exclusion from God. And everything done to Jesus, who is God, reveals the extent of man's rejection of God and revealed of our sin. On the other hand, all of this, the suffering and humiliation on the cross, the end of life in death, the burial and being forgotten and wandering in a place with God, without God are also the consequences of sin. This disclosed the wrath of God against men. Karl Bass says, where God's grace is rejected, man rushes into his own mischief. It is here where God himself has become man that the deepest truth of human life is manifest, the total suffering, which corresponds to total sin. In fact, not just the cross, death, burial, 
and descent into hell, but also the 33 years between his birth and death on earth can be summarized with the word, with, with the word suffered. Jesus was not accepted by his own family, rejected by national leaders and the crowds. And even within his closest circle of disciples, there were those who betrayed him and denied him. Jesus' entire life of suffering was a bearing of the cost of human sin. He stood in the place of man before God, bearing all of the sufferings. Everything that should have fallen upon each of us because we have all rebelled against God and are condemned was placed upon him. Now, God himself has made the great exchange. He has taken our place and put our judgment upon himself. Bearing all of our burdens, the punishment that should have been imposed on us, now have been removed because of Christ's death. We are no longer considered sinners by God, but have been reconciled with him. God's redemption is above all guilt, and this is entirely by God's grace. And so, brothers and sisters, this is the Jesus Christ whom we believe in. He is totally different from us in nature, not being part of this fallen created world, but for your sake and mine, and for the sake of mankind, he became a true man who lived in, in the Middle East about 2,000 years ago. He was rejected and abandoned by men. He suffered in his entire life, borne the punishment that was ours, bringing us back to the Father's home. Thus, we thank him, we praise him, we worship him. When we recite the creed, I believe in Jesus Christ, we sincerely declare with our hearts and mouths, Jesus Christ is my Lord, and I believe in him. I believe is not just acknowledging the existence of Jesus and that these accounts of his are true. I believe also means a relationship, a deep connection between me and Jesus Christ. And this connection involves intellect, mind, emotion, and volition. I trust him. I have full confidence in him, and I depend fully on him. I know he never failed me, and he will never fail me in the future. In him, I find the anchor of my life. I find solid ground. He is my home. He is my Lord, to whom I entrust everything. Therefore, the path he walked is the path I am willing to take. And as our passage says, Philippians chapter 2, Jesus, he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He made himself nothing. He took the very nature of a servant. He was made in human likeness. And he humbled himself. He became obedient to death and even death on a cross. And brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ walked on a downward and selfless path from incarnation all the way to the cross. He is the only one 
who ever existed in this world. He is the only one who could actively choose how to be born and what kind of life he can have. Yet, he chose to give up the freedom of choice, living a completely passive life. As the words in the creed showed on the screen. And this downward and selfless path should also be our way of life. For the benefit of others, one willingly gives up the right, setting aside the pride and position, and no longer fighting for resources, power, and praise. As Novan says, The way of Jesus is radically different. It is the way not of upright mobility, but of downward mobility. And it is worth choosing because it is the way to the kingdom, the way Jesus took and the way that brings everlasting life. So brothers and sisters, we need to reflect Am I only thinking about myself, wanting more and more without considering others' needs? Do I always think that I am right and refuse to listen to others? Am I too proud to admit my mistakes? And indeed, some members in the Philippian church were such people, and they were hard to get along with and caused big problems in the church. And this attitude is also very common in all kinds of human communities, causing conflicts and even division in family, workplace, and churches. And if we look at the entire world, actually this is also the cause for the relationship, for the bad relationships between nations, even wars. So brothers and sisters, in our relationship with one another, our mindset must be transformed. And every time we recite the Apostles' Creed, may it remind us of the downward and selfless way of our Lord Jesus Christ. And let us pray. Father, we we pray that you help us to be able to say yes to you and you help us to walk on the path of Jesus and so that we can be more and more in his likeness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.